We want to welcome you to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center virtual field trip. Thank you so much for joining us. Teachers, if you're watching or not signed up, please go to www.tiny.cc slash high school restoration and sign up for us, please. Uh, the program today is erosion and deposition. During this virtual field trip, student will compare the roles of erosion and deposition through the actions of water, wind, ice, gravity, and igneous activity by lava and can constantly reshaping the Earth's surface. Uh, Mr. Dominguez will tell you all about weathering. Erosion will be covered by Ms. Ramirez. Ms. Schramm will talk about deposition, and Mr. Monroe will introduce a stream table to you. Uh, students, you cannot ask us a verbal question during the program, but you can go to www.tiny. Dot cc slash question space answer and send us in your questions. We'll be glad to answer them. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Mr. Dominguez is going to tell you all about weathering. Hey guys, it's Mr. Dominguez. And one of my favorite things to do in the spring is growing chili plants, but I would not be able to grow anything without soil. When I was a lot younger, I didn't realize that the primary component of soil is rock. But how do we go from these big rocks to the soil that we use to plant our food? Well, rock breaks down through a process called weathering. And there's different types of weathering. Uh, there's physical weathering, chemical weathering, and in today's virtual field trip, we'll give you guys some examples. And since it's winter time, we'll start off with the way water freezes and expands and breaks down rock. Let's get started, guys. All right, guys, so weathering is the breakdown of rock and weathering happens in different ways. But the first way we are going to talk about is physical weathering, or sometimes it's referred to as mechanical weathering because physical weathering does not alter the composition of these rocks. So there's no chemicals that change uh, the properties of these wonderful rocks. This is a shale, by the way. This is granite. We have some feldspar. Uh, and we have this unknown rock that I found outside, uh, but it looks like limestone to me. But all of these rocks go through physical weathering. And like I said, physical weathering is just uh, a very simple breakdown of the rock through mechanical means. So me doing something like this, just breaking down this shale, is considered physical weathering because I didn't alter the chemical properties of this rock. Uh, that, that would be chemical weathering or... Um, biological weathering sometimes but physical weathering is a very simple breakdown of the rock and one of the ways that physical weathering occurs is through the power of water and you may be wondering well mr dominguez if i poured some water on this rock not a lot would happen well you'd be surprised as to how powerful water can be especially when it freezes so it's winter time so I want you guys to think about what happens to water when it freezes. It changes from a liquid to a what? A solid, right? And when that process occurs, water expands, right? So rocks are permeable. So that means that water can get inside of these rocks. So think about what happens when you leave a soda can inside of the freezer on accident. You leave it you go away for a couple of hours, you come back, the can exploded. Why? Because the liquid inside that can expanded and broke, exploded that can. So the same thing happens to these rocks when the water that's gotten inside of them freezes. And a really simple way to visualize this is to uh, use an egg. So for this demonstration, you would need an egg you would need a plastic bag, a Ziploc bag. So you would put the egg inside the bag so you don't make a mess. And what would happen to this eggshell if it went inside the freezer for, let's say, 24 hours? 
what would happen to the eggshell? Well, it would crack, right? Because the insides of this egg are primarily water. So the same thing happens to these rocks. When that water expands, it goes through a type of weathering called physical weathering because water is expanding when it freezes and it breaks down this rock, right? So simple way of demonstrating physical weathering is by freezing an egg in your freezer. And I'll show you guys what happened to the egg in a little bit. All right, guys, the next type of weathering that I'm going to talk about is chemical weathering. And chemical weathering happens when a chemical reaction occurs between rock and a substance usually found in water. So the way I'm going to demonstrate chemical weathering is by getting some limestone. And the primary component of limestone is calcium. And this calcium found in the limestone is going to react with an acid. And this is a household acid called vinegar. You might have heard of it. Uh, and you can try this at home. If you don't have limestone available to you, well, lucky you, chalk, which I'm sure you have access to at school, maybe even at home, is also limestone. It's a type of limestone that's very soft and perfect for writing on um, chalkboards. Uh, but I guess those don't exist anymore. So I want you to see, I want you to focus on what happens to this limestone, what happens when I pour this very acidic vinegar, and by the way, the pH of vinegar is around two, so it's very acidic. So I want you guys to focus on what happens to this rock as I pour some vinegar inside of this beaker. So let's see what happens. So focus on, on the rock, and let's see what happens to it. Do you guys see that? What is happening? a chemical reaction is occurring before our eyes. So this is breaking down the rock. So this is another type of weathering called chemical weathering. Pretty cool, right? All right, guys, so let's go check on that egg that we put in the freezer earlier. It's been a few hours. Uh, let's see if I can get this bag open with one hand. Uh, but it does appear that we do have a crack. And remember that the shell is representative of our rock. And as you can see, we have a crack. So we have a break in our shell. And that's because the water inside of the egg was expanding as it froze. Cool stuff. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this portion of your virtual field trip. Today, we talked about physical and chemical weathering. There are other types of weathering, but the end result is the same, the breakdown of rock. Now, please keep in mind that both weathering and erosion can take millions of years, but both are very important geological processes that are vital to our survival. Without weathering, we wouldn't have the soil that we use. And keep in mind that soil is a natural resource that we use for so many things. But I will leave it here. Have a wonderful day, guys, and I'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Uh, we did have a question. Please give a description of weathering. The physical disintegration and chemical decomposition of earth materials at or near the earth's surface. Thank you, Mr. Dominguez. And now, uh, Ms. Ramirez is gonna tell you all about erosion. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez. And in this segment, we're gonna be learning all about erosion. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you guys and we'll get started with the presentation. I do have a couple of essential questions for y'all. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to answer these two questions. The first is define erosion and give an example. And the second is uh, give examples of how 
uh, water, wind, ice, and or gravity are involved in erosion. So erosion is super simple. It is just the movement of sediment. So earlier you guys learned that weathering is the breakdown of sediment. Erosion would be the next step when it moves. And so I like to think of it as uh, that little animated uh, cartoon movie, Madagascar, and how they like to sing the Move It, Move It song. So erosion is just the movement of sediment. And if you take a look at some of these images on the slide, be thinking about how are these examples of erosion or the movement of sediment. You'll also hear me use the word deposition too. Uh, those two words kind of go hand in hand. You'll learn more about deposition with Ms. Schramm in the next segment, uh, but just be aware you, you will hear me say that word too. Uh, so in our next slide, we're gonna talk about how erosion can be caused by wind. So we know that wind can move sediment. A good example is sand dunes. So the wind will pick up those tiny pieces of sand particles and carry them to a new location. Eventually due to gravity, that sand sediment is going to drop or deposit in a new location and form those sand dunes. So through the movement of erosion, and also deposition, the dropping of that sediment, we have sand dunes forming. Another good example of erosion are sand storms. If you've ever been up to West Texas near Amarillo or even Lubbock, uh, quite often they have these little sand storms. Um, and I was stuck in one back when I went down there uh, during spring break last year and it was crazy. Uh, but those sand storms will kick up all of that uh, sand or uh, the soil sediment, and it will carry it to new locations. So again, erosion is just the movement of sediment, and we know that it can be caused by wind. Erosion can also be caused by ice. Now, we're probably not going to see a lot of evidence of that here in Texas, uh, but just know that glaciers can move sediment uh, down and transport them to new locations, and also through the help of gravity, that sediment is going to be deposited in a new location. We know that glaciers um, can create these broad U-shaped valleys. So we have different landforms that can form as a result of erosion. So we know that ice can indeed move or erode sediment. Not only can ice move sediment, but also water. Uh, so water is a very common agent of erosion, and you'll probably see examples of erosion caused by water, maybe even in your own backyard or school. So water can move sediment, as you see here in these images. Here we have a, an area that has flooded. There was so much rain and water, and you can see that that water here is a murky brown color. And so we know that sediment is being carried away in that water. And we know that running water or moving water can create these deep V-shaped valleys. So again, other landforms can be created through the erosion caused by water. Uh, we can also have erosion caused by gravity. So we know that gravity is that force that pulls things down. Uh, some great examples we have are things like mudslides and landslides. So gravity can pull those sediment and mud and soil down a hill. Eventually it's gonna stop moving and it's going to deposit. And of course we have deposition. So again, erosion and deposition kind of go hand in hand. Remember erosion is the actual movement and then deposition is when it stops moving and it drops it in a new location. So again, mudslides, landslides, we even have some of those here in Texas as well, especially when we get heavy rains and floods. And then here's a quick little video of some examples of experiments that you guys can do at home or at school. This first one is how to recreate uh, sand dunes. All you need is a box, some sand and a straw. You're just gonna blow into the straw and watch the movement of that sand and create some sand dunes. So again, we know that wind can erode or move sediment. And you can clearly see uh, the sand particles being moved and also being deposited in a new location to help form those dunes. Here's another example. All you need is just a box with some sand and some soil. So the white stuff is my sand. I have some nice dark soil 
and our agent of erosion here is water. So I'm gonna pour that water and you can see that the water is causing that white sand to move or erode downhill. So again, we know that water can cause erosion. It can cause sediment to move to a new location and then eventually deposit. We're also gonna do the same experiment, but with ice cubes. And those ice cubes are going to represent glaciers. So notice that as those ice cubes are moving, they're also picking up some of that white sand and they're carrying it and moving it to a new location. So again, we have an example here of erosion, the movement, and then deposition, the dropping of that sediment. And those are just super easy experiments you guys can do at home. This next one is a little poem. Erosion takes it, and when the motion stops, deposition drops. Break, move, drop. These are the processes that happen to a rock. Takes it, erosion takes it, and when the motion stops, deposition drops. Break, move, drop. These are the processes that happen to a rock. Wind and water moving around, gravity pulls it down. Break, move, drop. And that was just a little poem to help you guys remember those three processes. So remember we had uh, weathering, which was the breaking of sediment or rock. And then we had erosion, uh, which is the movement. And then later on with Ms. Shram, you'll go more in depth into deposition, that dropping of sediment. And my challenge for you guys is to go on a scavenger hunt and see if you guys can find examples of weathering, erosion, and deposition at your school or your home. And I've actually seen a lot of examples out here at the Environmental Center. So see what you guys can find. And I do have a couple of thinking questions for you guys. So think about how does erosion change Earth's surface and how does erosion affect uh, the environment and people? Uh, so out here at the Environmental Center, we have a hiking trail in the Post Oak Preserve. And we have these little, they look like stairs in the forest. Kids always ask, why are there stairs in the forest? But those stairs are super important because they help keep the soil in place. If we did not have those stairs, like you see here in this image, during times of heavy rainfall, the water would simply carry all that dirt and soil away and we would have a huge muddy mess. Uh, so these stairs are a form of erosion control uh, that we have in our post oak preserve. Now, in our Post Oak Preserve, uh, you're also not supposed to be riding ATVs or four-wheelers, and that is because things like that uh, can cause erosion. So you can see this little person over here who's um, riding his bike on this steep slope. Notice all that sediment that's being picked up and moved as he's uh, riding his bike. So people can cause um, the movement of sediment as well. And that's all I have for you guys today on erosion, the movement of the sediment. We're going to give it back to Dr. Gorman to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Ramirez. And a student wants an example of erosion. And Ms. Ramirez just showed a great picture of what uh, this definition is. Soil from a river bank being carried downstream. Now, I crossed the Trinity River twice a day, and I've been watching for many years. I've been watching that river bank along there. And it has changed considerably in the time that I've been crossing that river because of the Trinity River washing the dirt downstream. And now, Ms. Schramm is going to talk to you about deposition. Hey, everybody, it's me, Ms. Schramm, and we are talking all about deposition. So, let me get to the thing. Perfect. Okay. So at the end of my little section, you'll be able to compare the roles of erosion and deposition through the actions of water, wind, and ice. So uh, we are going to obviously focus on deposition, which you already know a little bit about because like Ms. Ramirez said, our two topics go hand in hand. So what is deposition? Simple definition is deposition is the movement and addition of rock and soil in a new place due to water, ice, or wind. So erosion is the actual moving, deposition is the dropping of it. So it's leaving it in a new place. So moves and drops. 
Um, I like to think of erosion as negative and deposition as positive. So erosion, you're taking something out and away and deposition, you're dropping something new in a new place. So let's go into some examples. So deposition can be caused by water. This example is um, when that river flows towards the sea, it takes all that soil with it, right? So that's the erosion part, but what happens to all that soil once it reaches the sea? So it's deposited at the mouth of rivers and that forms deltas. So you can see all that sediment that was carried by the rivers is now suddenly dropped into um, the new bigger body, bigger body of water. So now we have deltas. Also on the coastline, um, you can get a sea spit. So a sea spit forms um, when soil and other materials are deposited um, where the sea meets a river. And that can also form salt marshes um, with silt and mud um, deposited once that river meets the sea. So there's a lot of other interesting landforms that can be formed um, when rivers meet the sea, not always just deltas. Um, you can also see these are sandbars. So if you've ever been to um, the beach, sometimes you might notice that when you're walking into the ocean, it gets deep and then all of a sudden it gets shallow again. So especially depending on the tides, um, when it's low tide, you can definitely see the sandbars or um, walk out onto a sandbar like these people are doing. And how that's formed is like under the waves when the sand is moved um, towards the beach and deposited or vice versa moved from the beach and moved out into the water and is deposited it forms sandbars. So there are areas that are deeper into the water um, that are now shallow because there's underwater mounds of sand that were deposited there. So that can be pretty cool because you can go out there and see a bunch, of, a bunch of shells and other sea creatures that you wouldn't necessarily see all the way up high on the beach. So next we have deposition by wind. So you learned a little bit about sand dunes before. So yes, erosion and deposition go hand in hand right here. You can see on the left that sand is being eroded, but then on the right, it's also being deposited. So once it's dropped, it forms um, a new sand dune. So erosion and deposition are happening simultaneously here to make sand dunes and making the desert um, surface constantly changing. Um, then I thought of an example that we don't really think of very often because this is a storm. It's not something that happens all the time, but something that can help you think of erosion and deposition is um, by tornadoes. So tornadoes can erode land and soil and sediment and trees and living things and also man-made things. Um, and it picks it up and takes it away. That's the erosion. And then what happens when the storm dissipates? All that debris is dropped in a new spot. Um, so that's a good way to think of deposition when all that debris is dropped off in a new place. Um, that's, depo that's deposition. So even though you might not think of it uh, very often, it still works and it helps me remember. So next we have deposition by ice. And we know that the glaciers covered a lot of our continent and moved over the continents and caused a bunch of different landforms. So you can see glacial ice moving, um, but what happens when it melted or as it traveled across the land, it left behind different um, rocks and things like that um, and soil called glacial till. So as it picked up sediment, as it moved, eventually when it melts or moved on, it would drop and leave soil and rock behind called glacial till. And they can also form glacial plains. You can see, well, the one on the right is blurry, but the one on the left, you can see rocks be left behind um, during the ice age, which now is covered with plants and grass. All right, so we are going to play a game. You've heard a lot about erosion and deposition. And so now you're going to um, get different pictures and different landforms or different scenarios. And you're gonna have to guess which one is an example of deposition. So there's gonna be five. And of course I can't hear you. So 
you're going to have to keep track of if you got them correct yourself. So first one, which natural event is an example of deposition? And bonus, what natural force is causing this result? So wind, water, or ice. So one of these is an example of deposition. So your job is to figure out which one. So we've got on the left, waves washing away sand at the beach. And on the right, we have deltas forming at the mouths of rivers. And teachers, if you wanna pause in between for them to discuss and decide and keep track, that's fine. Otherwise, I'm gonna keep moving on. So the correct answer is da 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 da. Uh, deltas. So silt is deposited by water forming deltas at the mouths of rivers. So that is our correct answer. All right, question number two. Which natural event is an example of deposition and what is causing the result? So we have on the left, soil blocking a road after a mudslide or caves being formed by acid rain dissolving limestone. All right, so the correct answer is soil deposited by water. So the mudslide moved the soil and what happened? It dropped it right on the road. So there's our deposition. Now we know that the caves being formed um, by acid rain dissolving, that is going to be um, chemical weathering. When you see acid rain and you see the word dissolved, you're gonna think of chemicals. So that's chemical weathering. All right, so question number three. Which event is an example of deposition? We have the river flowing through a canyon on the left, and then we have layers of sediment at the bottom of a lake. All right, hopefully you said um, the silt deposited by water at the bottom of a lake. So all that sediment that's in the pond or at the edges of the pond, that washes into the water, eventually settles down due to gravity at the bottom of the pond, causing that icky, yucky mud and silt in the bottom. All right, question number four. We have wind blowing sand into a rock and carving out arches, or we have boulders left behind by glaciers. And hopefully you said it was the boulders deposited by the glaciers or the ice. So here is a giant boulder, similar to the rocks I showed you earlier, that was left behind during the ice age by glaciers. All right, last one. Um, we have sand dunes being blown across the desert, or sorry, sand being blown across the desert, forming sand dunes, or tree roots wedging and growing into a rock. All right, hopefully that was an easy one for you. And you guessed, whoops, you guessed sand dunes. So sand being deposited by wind. All right, well, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much. And I can't wait to see you next time. Thank you, Ms. Schramm. And a question came in. What is an unusual example of deposition? Well, we, we think more about moving dirt around and rocks around and everything. But this one is the most typical, uh, a very unusual example of deposition would be frost. Frost is the deposition of water vapor from humid air or air containing water vapor onto a solid surface. And the next time you get in your car in the morning and it's real cold and there'll be some uh, moisture in the air during the night, the frost will be on there. I've never even considered that before. Thank you again, Ms. Schramm. And let's let Mr. Monroe tell us about stream tables. Okay, students, my name is Mr. Monroe, and we're going to be looking at a very simple stream table that I have put together for you guys today. Now, there are stream tables that can really be elaborate. I've seen some. And uh, there's a variety of ways that this model that we call a stream table can be set up. And basically, they're set up to study geometric systems such as hilltops, rivers, uh, and even the co ocean coastline. Now, there's a couple of things I want you to remember. You know, we uh, have students construct all oh, simple stream tables, but some of the elaborate stream tables are created and set up by scientists. Now, why would a scientist set up such a thing to, I guess you might say, play with or observe? 
I want you to be thinking about that as I go through my presentation with you. And also, I want you to think about where there might be some limitations of using a stream table, okay? And basically they are used as a model. They're used to observe the processes that would normally take millions of years for it to happen. And with using a stream table, those processes can be observed in a matter of minutes. Now, there are some limitations and those limitations are these, time constraint or time dependence, and then uncertain applicability, okay? So now you have seen weathering as presented earlier, you've seen erosion as presented earlier, and you've seen examples of deposition. Those three things that you have already observed, those are earth processes. Students, we live in a changing world. By the time that you all reach the age of 30 to 40 years old, this planet that you're living on will have some changes. And those geological changes will be gradually brought about because of the processes that you have learned about on your virtual field trip today. Well, better yet, let me go ahead and show you this simple stream table that I have set up for you. Hopefully I can get it on camera. Now, if you were here with me today, we would uh, have one of these at each lab table and I would have you guys set it up. Now there are certain control factors about a stream table. It's the slope that the table is setting at. It's also the nature of the surface. Now, I'm doing a little experimenting today. I kind of mix this soil that you see here in the, in the tray. I don't know whether you can see it. Maybe I can get it a little closer. But you can see that there's some red soil mixed in with the sand. And there's also some, some darker soil that came, over, came from around the building here. And I wanted to see something that some geologists would like to observe, and that is topsoil disturbance, okay? And the direction of that topsoil disturbance. I tried to make my little stream, simple stream table fancy by simply putting a little what appears to be vegetation growth in it, okay? And we do have a slope, and normally, uh, most stream tables, they say that a liter of water being gradually released on that stream table can be scaled at maybe what would happen in one, one million years. Well, this is a very small one, so it's not going to take very long, and it's not going to take very much water to get a result. So I'm going to start by using this graduated cylinder, and I'm going to start releasing, releasing water and we'll see what happens. Okay, I'm gonna put just a little bit more and I can see the red soil from my home state of Oklahoma. There was some topsoil disturbance because underneath the sand, that's where I embedded the red soil from my home state of Oklahoma. Now, the thing about a stream table, we know that landforms usually happen because of those earth processes that you've already learned about. Weathering, erosion, which is the transporting of the weathered material, and then the laying down of it. Well, guess what? We have a landform here that we might call a canyon. And then a little further down, we have what we call a drainage basin or the river flow. Here where the land begins to flatten out and the flow slows down, we have deposition going on. The laying down of silt and sediment, gravity and water. When they're working in concert, they are the strongest erosion agents on our planet, students. Of course, Wind does some eroding, but when you put water and gravity working together, it is uncomp uncomparable to any other agents working together on our planet. 
It is said that if you walk across six to eight inches of hard running water, it can actually knock you down. So there you go. Well, here we have what appears to be a landform called a delta. Up here is a canyon. And you might liken that, liken that to the Grand Canyon. But I like to liken this river basin here, or this river here, to the Mississippi River. I have put a map, and I'm going to take that off of that and come back up. I have put a map of the United States up here on the board. And we have the Mississippi River, which is the largest watershed in North America. It actually furnishes water for 23 of the continental USA states, okay? Now, the mouth of the river empties into the Gulf of Mexico. And at that Gulf, the flow of that river slows down and deposition starts happening there. And some of the soils that come from mid, mid, mid United States, which is very rich, a lot of the silt and soil has been washed down and deposited in deposition on top of that delta. This delta, people that raise or raise crops in that area that have formed, that is some of the richest soil that we can find in the area, simply because of the formation of that landform that we call the Mississippi Delta. Hopefully I've been able to help you learn a little bit about uh, the use of stream tables. And I want you to remember, scientists really get serious about using uh, stream tables. They use it as a model to learn about rivers and how they behave. You know, models are used exclusively in the field of science to accurately depict processes and mechanisms that cannot be readily observed in the field and the time. So I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Gorman. So if any of you have any questions, I bet he can answer them for you. Thank you so much. Uh... Mr. Monroe and the other teachers also. We did have a question. Where can we get a stream table? Okay, you can make one yourself like Mr. Monroe did. He explained it pretty thoroughly. Pretty simple, very inexpensive. Or you can purchase one from a science supply company such as Carolina Biological. Or if you are in the Dallas School District, your teacher can go to the Dallas ISD Science Resource Center and check one out so you can use it in the classroom. Thank you again. And now I'm going to share my screen. During this virtual field trip, students compared the roles of erosion and deposition through the actions of water, wind, ice, gravity, and igneous activity by lava in constantly reshaping the Earth's surface. Mr. Dominguez talked to you about weathering. Erosion was covered by Mr. Ramirez. Ms. Shroud told you all about deposition. Mr. Monroe just demonstrated a stream table. Thank you, teachers, so much for joining us. If you would, go to www.tiny.cc slash HS feedback. Fill out a very short form and send it back to us. We would appreciate it. You guys have a great rest of the day. Looks like you need to get ready for that bad weather this afternoon. Thank you.